Okay, I'm used to having an MC introduce me, so I'm going to introduce myself. A few people have heard this before. Hi. This is um, from one of my favorite websites. I'm rocking their t-shirt. It says, uh, my name is Michael Bolden, and it says, Michael Bolden is an ideologue who has spent years promoting the idea that states can nullify federal legislation they don't like. The very same argument pushed by defenders of slavery and segregation, and just as baseless now as it was then. And that's from my profile page, which has been up for about seven years over at the Southern Poverty Law Center as one of the 30, 30 leaders of the anti-government movement. Okay, that's my, that's my claim right there. So let's do this, right? You guys all do like, uh, you guys write to congressmen and stuff like that here? How many of you guys write letters and stuff? You ever get the results you like? Oh, Nick, kind of once in a while. Oh, you get meetings. <laughs> with who? Did you get one with McCain? You're Arizona, right? No. Oh, yeah, I'm sure they do. <laughs> if they do, we have to talk because there's a problem, dude. So a few of you may know that I have never done this until recently. I uh, recently drafted my first ever letter to someone in Washington, D.C., other than my uncle who used to live there when I was a kid back in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but uh, I'd never written to a politician because my thought is I'm going to tell one of these people to do something or not do something, and it's a waste of my time and energy. So I wanted to kind of share with you. I wrote it a few years ago. I never sent it off, but I'm ready to go, finally. Being a Californian, I have a lot of people to choose from, so I decided to go with this. You guys uh, let me know if you think it's good. You ready? Ready? Yeah. Okay, yeah, it's a morning. Dear Kamala, go to hell. Sincerely, Michael Bolden. That's it, that's it. <laughs> Okay, so the title of this presentation, now that we're done with the jokes, is Sanctuary Cities for Everything. I guarantee you this is a bit of a clickbait title. I cannot deliver on this completely, but my goal is I'm going to share with you some things that are happening on the ground, and you're going to have a little light bulb go off, and you're going to think, oh, dude, that makes sense. I can run with this, and I can apply this to blank, whatever is important to me personally in my area. My goal is less to talk about philosophy. I think other people are far better than that, and to talk about strategy of getting shit done. So if you guys are cool with that, I will dive into a little boring foundational stuff, and then we'll get into some juicy follow-up if that's cool. So good? Yeah. I need validation at all times. Sorry. <laughs> Insecurity. I was the baby of the, I'm the baby of the family, so I always have to be told that I'm loved. So just under six weeks before the Philadelphia Convention in 1787, see there's the boring historical part, James Madison sent his friend George Washington a letter outlining what he thought should be the proper stu structure for a new government. He proposed what would be far more centralized than what they had under the Articles of Confederation. It was actually far more centralized than what they actually passed at the Philadelphia Convention, and it was far closer to what we have today in practice. Now, in a notable section of the letter, he told Washington that a new national government should have a veto power over every act of the state or local governments. Political subdivisions of the state are part of the state. So he said that the new national government should veto over everything. This is how he put it. Quote, a negative in all cases whatsoever on the legislative acts of the states as heretofore exercised by the kingly prerogative appears to me to be absolutely necessary and to be the least possible encroachment on the state jurisdiction. Now, that's pretty absurd to me because I think of centralized power generally as aggressive, but he was thinking that the states were pretty unruly and they had to defend against the states. And here's how he, uh, he put it. Quote, without this defensive power, here's the money quote, without this defensive power, every positive power that can be given on paper will be evaded and defeated. So if you think about that, without a national veto, without the central government having a veto power over all the acts of state and local uh, governments, 
James Madison, who I think was smarter than I am, just telling you what he said, he felt that every single power delegated to the federal government would be evaded and defeated, everything. Now the final version of his proposal made it as resolution number six when Edmund Randolph presented the Virginia plan on May 29th of 1787. Madison, Randolph, and a few others, they wanted the central government to have the power to use the, quote, full force of the union against any state that didn't comply with federal demands. This was rejected by the convention. A national veto didn't actually make it into the Constitution. It wasn't even debated at the state ratification debates. But less than a year later, Madison was singing a different tune. Politician, anyone? Like, all of a sudden, instead of his private correspondence with George, not Bush, uh, but in his private correspondence, he was saying, this is the worst thing that could happen if we don't get a national veto. All of a sudden, he's like, you know what? This is a feature. And so in Federalist 46, which is a limited run set of papers, part of uh, the Federalist Papers, which is primarily for the people of New York, he was advertising the ability of states to evade and defeat federal programs as a feature rather than a flaw. And he included four steps that individuals and states can take to get the job done, including this little gem. Quote, their repugnance and perhaps refusal to cooperate with officers of the union. Now, you might think like I do, the word repugnant means grossed out. I think of politicians, government, and what they do as pretty disgusting. You guys do too, right? Most of it? Yeah, I'm on board. Grossed out, disgusting. But he didn't think, this is not how he was writing. The number one dictionary of the time, probably Samuel Johnson's Dictionary of the English Language, probably 1785 edition, it defined repugnant as disobedient not obsequious, which is compliant. So James Madison, short version, James Madison said, if you want to defeat the federal government, you have to disobey them. Not vote the bums out, disobey them. That was his words. And he also said that states and their political subdivisions should use what he called legislative devices to make that happen. Now, if enough states did this, according to James Madison, this would, quote, present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. Now, did he flip-flop? Politician, right? Maybe Jefferson writing letters to him from France. Maybe Jefferson changed his mind. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really matter, because here's the bottom line. Feature or flaw. When enough people say no to the federal government, and enough states or cities pass laws backing them up, refusing to implement their programs, there's not much the federal government can do to force their so-called laws, regulations, or mandates down our throats. Was that a clap? Joshua Smith. <laughs> Joshua invited me here for the road trip, so thank you, Joshua, and thank you guys all for actually listening to me blab. So now keep in mind, James Madison advised this at a time when the federal government did almost nothing. His presidential predecessor, Thomas Jefferson, a number of years later, he was complaining about the national debt at a time, thank you to my buddy Mike Meharry back here who did the research, at a time when the federal government only had 130, is it 130, Mike, non-military employees in 1800? Yeah, so about 130 non-military employees. Can you imagine Donald freaking Trump saying, oh man, we got to do some cuts. We got 130 employees. This is insane. The federal government was tiny at the time. Now they tell us or they claim the power to be involved in basically everything. They tell us what kind of plants we can grow and consume in our own home. They tell us how big our toilet can be. They've told us what kind of light bulb we can have. They tell us that the words shall not be infringed actually means something different than shall not be infringed. Like, oh, if the caliber's too high, or if you can put a, an accessory on it, or if it fires too fast, or if it's undetectable. Can you imagine that? Uh, the right to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed unless we don't know you have a gun. 
I mean, this is absurd. And it's bad. But here's the good news. Almost all, almost all of the unconstitutional garbage that comes out of Washington, D.C. is implemented or enforced in partnership with the states. You guys remember that last shutdown? Not the most recent one. Shutdown, right? I'm talking to libertarians. When I talk to right-wingers and I say shutdown or left-wingers, and they're like, yeah, government's closing. And they don't know what the hell they're talking about. <laughs> Education is a problem, especially with government running it. So in the last so-called shutdown back in 2013, the National Governors Association was really concerned about this slowdown or shutdown, and they put out a public statement complaining about it. And what, where is this in my notes? They said, quote, states are partners with the federal government on most federal programs. TLDR, short version, partnerships don't work too well when half the team quits. Now, you might be thinking, Bolden, this is interesting. Cool, yeah. But we all know the Supreme Court has told us that you can't nullify. It's illegal. It's unconstitutional. So you're wasting my time with all this history crap. Boring, dumb, I don't care. So let's, uh, let's talk about that briefly. I promise briefly. Ish. <laughs> Ish. A lot of people, when they think about nullification... They have this kind of romantic vision of it that is just make-believe. We've all seen the original Ghostbusters. Anyone not seen the original Ghostbusters? Don't be ashamed. It's cool. We got uh, someone who's very comfortable with themselves. <laughs> There's a scene in the early part of the movie where they're in like a library or something. Correct me if I'm wrong on this, but they're in like a library. They don't really know what the hell they're doing. And they see this ghost lady. And Bill Murray is basically saying, okay, I got a plan, guys. Move slowly, move slowly, wait, 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 get her. And that's the entirety of his plan. They're just gonna just get her, they chase around, everything goes poorly, uh, maybe they figure out how to do things later on. So that's a how a lot of people think of nullification these days. Um, they think of, for example, really nasty, DEA agents, true, ATF agents, FDA, whatever. And they think of these people coming to kill you, to steal your stuff, to lock you in a cage, whatever, fine you. And then they think like there's some really happy, liberty-loving local police officer, you know, you're a county sheriff. And that guy's going to come over there and he's going to be like, ATF agent, get him. And they're going to arrest that guy and put him in jail and protect your liberty. You guys know what the real story is, though, right? When it comes to government, there are no good guys, period. I mean, if we're talking about as a group, I guess I'm sure there's a couple of outliers. But when it comes to government, there are no good guys. They're all bad guys. So you can't rely on them to actually be the good guys. But more importantly, no one is doing this. No one in history has, well, other than a handful of cases, no one in history has ever done this, proposed this, tried this. It just is not happening. So people who think this is happening, who talk about this happening like this, they're making it up. Hey, guys. What most situations of nullification happening they're actually using James Madison's advice of refusing to participate in the enforcement of federal law. And I can tell you, not to toot my horn, but I read a lot of freaking legislation. I mean, a lot. And let me tell you, this is the most disgusting part of my job. Day to day, I'm reading tons of bills. And over the last, we'll just say five years, I've probably, I've probably looked at at least 2,000 state level bills that address some kind of federal program, 2,000. And I'm gonna think maybe five of them have ever even proposed having a local sheriff arrest a DEA agent or an ATF agent. Only one has ever passed and no one has ever implemented it. No one ever does it. So this is just fantasy land. It is not real, no one's doing it. So we can just kind of throw that to the side. Now interestingly enough, 
the Supreme Court, not in just one arcane decision or opinion, they've repeatedly validated the strategy of backing off and refusing to implement federal programs. Uh, in five major cases, from 1842 to 2018, the Supreme Court, under something known as the Anti-Commandeering Doctrine, whose lawyer is in here? You guys all know anti-commandeering? I figured you would, right? I would say like five years ago, I, doing this work, maybe eight, I would talk to uh, lawyers that are friendly to the cause of liberty, and I would say, you know, anti-commandeering, they'd be like, oh, dude, I know I should remember this from my law school, but like, <laughs> refresh my memory. I'm like, I am not a lawyer, man. You're the person. So... <laughs> Under five major cases, 1842 to 2018, the Supreme Court has repeatedly and consistently held that the federal government cannot require states or their political subdivisions for us, that's primarily cities, counties, whatever, to use any resources, person power, money, facilities to help implement or effectuate federal acts or regulatory programs. Let's do a quick review of those boring cases but extremely important ones. The most recent one was in 2018, Last year, so this is modern, Murphy versus NCAA. Lawyers, you guys know this? This was a New Jersey sports betting case, and here the court held that Congress cannot take any action that, quote, dictates what a state legislature may and may not do, even when the state action conflicts with federal law. Samuel Alito put it this way, writing for a 7 to 2 majority, Quote, a more direct affront to state sovereignty is not easy to imagine. Yeah, it's good. I don't like the Supreme Court, but once in a while they're good. I'll take it when they're good. The most famous case is actually Prince versus U.S. Here the federal government was basically trying to commandeer local law enforcement to implement, and this is an Arizona case, Nick, um, they were trying to in require local law enforcement to help implement and effectuate the Brady Gun Control Act. Garbage, right? Yep, and my friend, Sheriff Richard Mack, along with his friend, Sheriff Jay Prince, who I think was in Utah at the time, he's now up in Montana, they sued the federal government on this, saying, we're not required to help you guys. Figure this out yourself. They sued and won. And here is what Scalia wrote for the majority, a narrow one, five to four. Quote, the federal government may neither issue directives requiring the states to address particular problems, nor command the state's officers or those of their political subdivisions to administer or enforce a federal regulatory program. The first one, oh yeah, cool, we'll take it, right? Now the first one is most interesting to me. In the 1842 Prigg versus Pennsylvania case, this one actually might be the most familiar to what we're seeing happen on the ground today. Justice Joseph Story held that the federal government could not require states or their, any of their employees to help act as federal slave catchers doing slave catching and redition under the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. Cool, that's the foundational stuff. You good with those? No one's sleeping yet? Harry's sleeping. He writes most of my stuff. So anything I'm saying, he's probably written anyway, so I don't really work. <laughs> so all, we're all familiar with the sanctuary city? Oh, at least we can't. Anyone here not ever hear of a sanctuary city or think that they don't know what it is? Who here likes sanctuary cities? Okay, cool. I did this speech on... And another event, and I had Scott Horton raise his hand to say he likes it, and everybody else hate. Do a bunch of people here hate the sanctuary or dislike them? Raise hand. Okay, if you, if you, okay. Larry Sharp does not like them. Okay, cool. cool. Let's talk about that. Okay, yeah, I'm gonna talk about this. This is awesome. I love, why am I not always talking to the L fucking P? Come on. Sorry for being inappropriate, but really, I love, <laughs> this is great. Man, when I bring this to Trump people, whew, <laughs> and I do, I guarantee you, I spoke at the 25th Annual Gun Rights Policy Conference up in San Francisco a number of years ago, about nine years ago, and I spent the entire time of my speech talking about weed. 
By the end, there was a pin dropping, and then everybody wanted to show me their medical marijuana card. <laughs> okay, so I actually have two issues with the term or phrase sanctuary city. One, that almost entirely refers to immigration sanctuary cities, which is what I am trying to rectify. And, okay, thank you. I'm a big fan of Larry Sharp, by the way. Thank you, sir. Thank you. This is a really good man. Alex Merced, is, is Alex here? Where's Alex? Oh, he bailed. Bored. He's bored. See, that, that stuff bored him. Oh, nice. I need a babysitter. Cool. So my other issue is that it's actually a bad term. It's, mis it's, a, it's not a good definition, but it's a politicized term. Both sides, pro and against, they use it and they like it. So whatever. So let's first understand what a sanctuary city is, or an immigration sanctuary city is. Now, there is no hard and fast rule for what they are, but they generally do one of two things. One, and there's about, some people tell you there's 100, some people tell you 500. I go with the 300-ish. It's cool, whatever. Maybe that's propaganda that I'm like spewing, but it doesn't, the number of them doesn't matter. What they do is most important to me and what effect they have. So in general, they do one of two things or both. First, they ban law enforcement from inquiring about the immigration status of any person. And the reason they do this is ostensibly to do an end run around 8 USC 1373, which is this crappy federal law on the books well, I shouldn't, no judgment. <laughs> We're inclusive here, right? So 8 U.S.C. 1373 is a federal law in the books that is, it's weird. It's a prohibition on a prohibition. The federal government years ago passed this thing. They said no state or local government can have a law or policy on the books or in practice that prohibits any of their agents or employees from sharing immigration status of a person with the federal government. Now, if you compare that to what Samuel Alito wrote just in 2018 in a 7-2 Supreme Court decision, a more direct affront to state sovereignty is not easy to imagine, is how they put it just last year. The idea that the federal government can tell local law enforcement that they can't have a policy about sharing, that they're not allowed to share immigration status, Ilya Soman writes for Volokh Conspiracy, and he's been covering this quite a bit if you want to research it more. But he basically thinks, and I agree, that the Trump administration, I, he probably doesn't put it like this, the Trump administration is so dumb. Like, so dumb in their strategy to shut down sanctuary cities that they're actually going to get this 8 U.S.C. 1373 overturned as illegal, unconstitutional, commandeering, of state governments or local governments. I think that is very likely. So far, Trump is getting smoked in the federal courts on this. It's working its way towards the Supreme Court, and it's possible they'll go totally different than they have for the last 150 years, but maybe they won't. It's possible, yeah, I mean. Uh, <laughs> so they're doing an end run around this federal prohibition. Now, if 8 U.S.C. 1373 gets struck down, then that makes the sanctuary city stronger because they don't have to use this strategy. And it also makes other types of sanctuary cities stronger in the long run, too. The other thing that they generally do is, man, this one's crazy. They ban law enforcement or jails, whatever the right term is, from keeping someone in prison beyond their release date. I mean, think about this. Nick, do you know what is the, the political maxim, would you know, or the legal maxim of if you're supposed to be in jail for 30 days, if they keep you in jail for 31, this is really bad. They're not allowed to do that, right? They're not unless you have another detainer. Yeah, so in, specifically, or a new arrest, right? So in Colorado, specifically, and probably in every state, if you're supposed to be in jail for seven days, 300 days, whatever it is, if you're in jail one extra day, it is considered a new arrest and they have to charge you with something. So surprisingly enough, the federal government, DHS ICE, they routinely send to local jails or law enforcement 
something called an immigration detainer request. Adam Kokesh, it is really good to see you, man. It's been too long. Yeah, cool. Um, they send an immigration detainer request. And on the form, it is called a request because it is not a requirement because they can't require people to keep them in jail longer. What they do is they say, oh, OK, you know, this is the dumbed down version for me. This is for my own brain. Basically, someone gets picked up uh, for whatever they're picked up for. They're held in prison or jail, whatever, for seven days. Let's say they're getting out on next week, Tuesday. And this goes through a matching system. And uh, ICE decides that this per is a person of interest for maybe a violating federal immigration law. And they know they're getting out of jail on Tuesday of next week. But they got a problem, a numbers problem. And so they send this immigration detainer request to the local jurisdiction, and they're like, yeah, we know, we know this person is going to be out on Tuesday, but we don't really have a lot of guys. And so can you hold them for a couple more days? Generally, it's 48, if not up to 72 hours. I think it might be 72. I might be wrong on that. But I know for sure at least 48 hours beyond their release date. They ask them to hold on to them still. And so obviously they were holding on to them for quite in a lot of places. And now there are policies on the books to say, we're not going to do this anymore. So this is a vast majority of the say, we'll say 300 or so immigration sanctuary cities. They do one or both of these things. Now a number of places are starting to go a little further. But anyone who tells you that this is an anti-Trump movement is either totally ignorant or lying. Because probably the most famous one is here in San Francisco. Anyone San Francisco resident? Oh, cool. Where do you guys live? Mission? Sunset's cool. Cool. Oh, nice, nice. I used to do an, I was a nightclub promoter years ago before I did this. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> and I used to do a, a, a Sunday afternoon party in Chinatown at a place called the Blind Tiger. I don't know if it's still around. It's a really cool little lounge. Anyway, sorry. Sorry. So San Francisco actually is the first, or probably the most famous. I think LAPD had a policy before this. But uh, San Francisco is the, probably the most famous. Their first ordinance was passed in 1989. That is not an anti-Trump effort. It was most recently amended in 2016. They do the first two things that I mentioned, but they also do this. They ban the use, oh my God, I'm old, I can't read. They ban the use of any city resources to, quote, assist or cooperate with any ICE investigation, detention, or arrest relating to the alleged violations of the civil provisions of federal immigration law. So they're basically just saying, we're not going to enforce this for you. We're not going to help you. Period. No resources. Two years earlier. Now, you guys have heard of the California Values Act? California Trust Act? California is a sanctuary state. In 2013, when Obama was in office, they passed the California Trust Act, which actually banned uh, any uh, government employees here in the state from actually complying with these immigration detainer requests. They couldn't hold them in jail longer than they're supposed to be held in jail. And then in 2015, SB 54, the California Values Act, the sanctuary state law, banned the use of resources in state for a narrow group of, of federal immigration enforcement. But California is not the first. In 1987, again, this is not an anti-Trump effort. This is just very widespread. Oregon was the first state in the country with the sanctuary state law on the books. It says this, quote, no law enforcement agency of the state of Oregon or of any political subdivision of the state shall use agency monies, equipment, or personnel for the purposes of detecting or apprehending persons whose only violation of law is that they are persons of foreign citizenship present in the United States in violation of federal immigration laws. They are banning the use of resources to cooperate with federal immigration enforcement. Last November, some opponents of this law in Oregon got a ballot measure 105 on the ballot to repeal it. It lost 63 to 37. Not that majoritarian thing means liberty or anything, but that's what happened. So from here, there are two important observations. One, 
not one single immigration sanctuary city or state of however many there are has a policy on the books that physically that does the go get them no one is physically interfering with federal immigration agents they are not like no one's doing barricades no one's arresting ice agents on the state level uh, there's a bill happening here in California where they're gonna try to prevent federal agents from doing arrests at courthouses that would be the closest but in general this is not happening as a general rule a vast majority in almost every situation they're just saying we are not going to help in most most of the time a very narrow area sometimes it's broader like San Francisco we're not going to help you do this you figure out how to do immigration enforcement the other important thing and I get this right from ice they're very interesting in their press releases if you've ever read them it's, I don't recommend it ice ATF has some of the craziest press releases and they do a lot neither of them should exist so ICE does these annual reports, and the most interesting one to me is the Enforcement and Removal Operations Report, ERO. And in the most recent one, 2018, we learned that there are about 6,100 ERO agents for the entire country. 6,100. Obama in 2016 had 5,700. Trump wanted to triple it to 15,000. Tripled. My government education math sucks. Trump wanted to triple it to 15,000. I think he even backed down to 10,000. The Republican-controlled Congress did not give him the money to do it, but he was able to find out. Maybe it was an emergency measure. He was able to beef it up from 5,700 to 6,100. Now, ICE has a problem with math. In fact, that not that they're government agents and they're not smart. Maybe they aren't, but they're running headstrong into math. When you have a workforce size, you know your workforce can only do a certain amount of stuff. You have a certain amount of capacity to do things. And we know that enforcement and removal operations has a capacity of about 250,000 removals per, per year. Interior, not at the border, interior removals per year. Obama's last year, 2016, there was 246,000-ish. Trump's first year went down to 226. And last year, 2018, it went up to 252. Now, ICE, and this is maybe a brief aside, ICE is funny how they do this. They talk about this as a huge success. They claim that because of the Trump administration and ICE's great border enforcement, that they brought it down from 242 to 226, and uh, then they, you know, the record high of 252. But it's not really much different than what Obama did. And mind you, if you think about it, of course, the claim is that there are 10 or 11 million undocumented immigrants in the country. Is that the number that they say now? 10 million? Let's just go with 10 million. Let's say they did really, they're just shutting down the border, right? If there's 10 million still in the country, why would the number go down? Because they still could be at full capacity, still doing 246 like Obama did. The fact is, even though it isn't just an anti-Trump thing, the opposition, the refusal to participate has actually ramped up a bit once Trump got in office. Now, for people who want zero removals, 250,000 is a lot, right? Now, if you want all removals, 10 million, here's the math problem. <laughs> I suck at math. Let's say, hypothetically, they had zero illegal border crossings and they kept it at full enforcement 250,000 a year it would take them 40 years to do full enforcement of federal immigration law and supposedly deport everybody illegally in the country 40 years and we often hear people in that camp say we're gonna get them all out of here right you guys hear this whether you agree with it or not, it's a freaking fantasy. It is not possible. It cannot happen, period. ICE puts it this way, quote, this is from 2018's ERO report, quote, 
The cooperation ICE receives from other law enforcement agencies is critical to its ability to identify and arrest aliens. It's critical. They even admit they can't do it without help. Here's how I put it in an op-ed that I wrote for The Hill. You guys all read it, right? Ah, Bolden writes something. I'm on it, right? No one's read this. <laughs> but I put it this way. Early 2017, quote, while Trump is certainly ramping up the pressure to fulfill campaign promises to take on sanctuary cities, should cities and states hold fast in their policies, they'll likely come out on, tor come out on top in court and on the ground. So people who complain about immigration sanctuary cities, they're not doing it because their feelings are hurt. They don't like the language in the San Francisco sanctuary ordinance. They're not complaining about it because of that. Oh, I can't hear this. I'm scared. They complain about it because they don't like the fact that it has an impact on the federal government's ability to do what they want as far as federal immigration enforcement. So what do they ask for? They tell us. Oh, Trump's, if you would hear the things that people write to the 10th Amendment Center, <laughs> it would be amazed. But I'll give you some brief ones, some light ones. Uh, Trump is going to take away all federal funding from all sanctuary cities. Now, we know that that is considered, at least, even by the federal government, to be unconstitutional coercion. They are not allowed to do it. They can't do it. They tell us the Trump administration is going to do the Ghostbusters move. They're going to go out there and arrest mayors. They're going to arrest local sheriffs who aren't enforcing federal immigration law for the federal government, spending state or local resources on it. They're going to go arrest these people. Yeah, get them. Again, fantasy. You know what I never hear? I know Ryan and Tracy probably have heard this three times. <laughs> I never hear something that goes a little like this. Those 300 gun rights sanctuaries need to start enforcing federal gun laws or they should lose their federal funding. You guys ever hear that? <laughs> yeah, because yeah, it doesn't exist. That's a problem that I hope we can rectify over time. Who's this we? But it doesn't exist. Now, there are some areas you may, if you're watching alternative media, you may be hearing about some people talking about gun sanctuaries. And we've been pushing for them to, to take this approach and this messaging for about four or five years. It's starting to catch on. A vast majority of them who are doing it, this is another speech entirely, a vast majority of them who are claiming it are not actually doing it. They don't qualify. There's a lot of problems. I tried advising a number of uh, counties that had ballot measures to do gun rights sanctuaries in Oregon that what they were doing was <laughs> they weren't stopping enforcement. They were ba What they're basically doing is saying the sheriff will determine whether or not something is unconstitutional. Not just saying, we're not gonna, we're gonna stop using resources. They're basically giving a hierarchical whatever. They're basically letting the sheriff decide. I guess it's something. If you have a good sheriff that says, I'm not gonna enforce gun laws, that's great. But most police love asset forfeiture and equitable sharing from the federal government, so they continue helping the federal government all the time. They're bad guys too. There are a few counties and towns, I mean like five, that I would qualify as gun rights sanctuaries. You wanna hear one? It ain't LA. <laughs> Back in 2013, the little town of Herndon, Kansas passed Ordinance 510. Herndon has a population of this, this, and that table. <laughs> it's like 120, right? And here's what it says, Ordinance 510, from the heroic Kenny Chartier, who was the mayor at that time, maybe Kenny Chartier, but it's Kansas. And it says this, quote, no agency of the city of Herndon, Kansas, or person in the employ of, of the city of Herndon, Kansas, shall enforce, provide material support for, or participate in any way in the enforcement of any act, law, treaty, order, rule, or regulation of the government of the United States regarding personal firearms, firearm accessories, or ammunition within the boundary of this city. That, my friends, is a gun rights sanctuary city. 
So that leads to me to my final little piece. We'll wrap it up here in a moment. We can do Q&A if I have time, I don't know. It's mostly hypothetical. So the ATF, ERO agents, about 6,100, right? 6,100 employees for the whole country. The ATF, anyone know how many employees the ATF has? Not you, Meharry? Anyone want to guess? No guesses? Oh, please. 10,000? Eh, it's about 5,000. Maybe Trump ramped it up because he has actually ramped up gun control enforcement since Obama. And of course, he has a turn in your bump stock thing. He hates guns. Um, I don't know how any of these people like him. But um, the ATF has just over 5,000 employees for the entire country. About a third of them are in, in administration, pencil pushers, eating your income. And if we're comparing workforce capacity again, if ERO does 250,000 removal operations for ICE with 6,100 employees, how many closed cases do those 5,000 ATF agents? Anyone want to throw out a guess? No guesses. You want to guess, right? Two, oh, Larry, I wish, I wish it was 200. It is actually about 8,000 closed cases per year. Now, we can actually think about this, and there's going to be a point. Let's say they're lazy government slobs, and they, their, <laughs> their work ethic is garbage. Let's just say that. And their 8,000 really could be like 20% higher. That's significant, right? If you run a business and you have a 20% increase out of your employees, that's pretty good, right? Yeah, let's say they, uh, they triple it, or let's say they do 10 times. They go up to 80,000, right? That'd be a huge increase. Think of it this way. If there were 10 or 11 million undocumented short-barreled shotguns in this country in violation of the Unconstitutional National Firearms Act of 1934, or if there were 10 or 11 million undocumented bump stocks in violation of the gun-hating Trump administration's bump stock ban, there is zero chance no fantasy land that they would ever be able to do full enforcement, even with help from state and local law enforcement. Does that make sense? This is how Andrew Napolitano put it a few years ago. The federal government does not have the person power and resources to enforce all federal laws on its own. Judge Knapp, not me. It needs the assistance of state and local police as well. They don't have that in Washington and Colorado because marijuana is lawful there. So it might be impractical and be too costly for the feds to enforce. So he went on and he made basically the same case that I'm making right now on guns. And he said our home state of New Jersey could not, for example, use the police to frustrate federal law enforcement. What it could say to state and local police is, you will not cooperate. That will make federal enforcement of tighter federal gun laws nearly impossible. Nearly impossible to enforce is music to my ears. I want to see 100% impossible to enforce on 100% of their unconstitutional garbage, basically everything they've done in modern times. But at this point, nearly impossible to enforce is a huge step forward for liberty. As a reminder, James Madison in Federalist 46, he said states and individuals should disobey and states should use legislative devices to refuse to cooperate with officers of the union. Doing this would present obstructions which the federal government would hardly be willing to encounter. In closing, here's how the great Etienne de la Boite put it. I do not ask that you place hands upon the tyrant to topple him over, but simply that you support him no longer. Thank you guys so much for listening to me blab here today. Do you guys want to do Q&A for 10 minutes? Did that make sense? Did anybody think that something did totally didn't make sense? Okay, cool, cool.
Okay, the question is, you brought up cannabis. Are there any local or state governments doing cannabis sanctuary? Yeah, because most of the time what, what's happening is in the states or localities, they're decriminalizing or legalizing what the federal government prohibits. And we now know that there are 33 states, the most recent being Oklahoma, Utah, and West Virginia that are defying federal law on a plant, which is very awesome. Oklahoma actually passed a much broader medical marijuana law than California ever had. You know how you have to have a qualifying condition here in California if you were doing medical? In Oklahoma, they just said it's up to the doctor. We're not going to, legislature isn't going to make a determination of what is qualifying conditions in Oklahoma while Trump is in office. So AB 1570, 1578 was last year here in California from Reginald Jones Sawyer. Would have done the exact same thing on marijuana. I don't know if he's reintroducing it for the new legislative session. So if we're thinking California. No, in short version, they're not even doing this yet. They're still helping enforce federal prohibition when the feds try to do it, and it's still that effective. So if they were to back off, my view is that this would be the total end of marijuana prohibition, on a, at least on a national level. Nick, please. Yes. No, they can't be required to actually do the arrest for the federal government. But if they were already being held, there wouldn't be an... In if they're already in jail, yes. 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 We know... They wouldn't have to go get you. No. No, and uh, and if if anyone actually tried to do that, right? But states cannot be commandeered. Again, from uh, 2018, Murphy versus NCAA, they said specifically states cannot be required to do or not do something, even when it conflicts with federal law. This is considered commandeering. I mean, we could see how that played out in the court, but that's not actually how it happens. We know in 99%, this is the FBI's number, 99% of marijuana arrests are done on a state level, not the federal level, so if the states just say we're not gonna do it anymore, it's done. Yes. Yeah, which is great. Yeah, because they don't have the manpower. Right, and that's, that's basically what I recommend applying to basically everything. Now, that doesn't mean there's no risk. People always run risk of armed goons messing with you <laughs> when you violate laws. But when people do it in large numbers and then states stop helping the federal government, then there's very little chance. Does that make sense? I, know. I appreciate your feedback on that, Nick, too. Appreciate it. Anybody else have questions? Sir? Yes, strength in numbers. The guy who was kind of so-so on the, oh, no, you didn't ever saw Ghostbusters. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your guy on secession. I mean, uh, yeah, I just don't know anything about it, to be honest with you. Like, yeah, I, I probably couldn't answer any questions. Sorry. I'm not a big fan of an armed standoff. 
Um, they got a lot of guns in Washington, D.C. I just think it's bad strategy, to be honest with you. There is a time and a place throughout history where people have done armed revolutions, whether it's the Trotskyites or whoever. People have done it and they've been successful. I think it is a very bad strategic choice. I believe in Rosa Parks, as far as a method, refused to participate. I think James Madison told us the same thing, so I'm going to go with them. They're smarter than me. That's my view. Anybody else have a question or comment? Sir? Okay, devil's advocate is fun. I'm not repeating the questions. I'm sorry for the video. I can. I hate the federal government too. Okay, so the devil's advocate question is if you, okay, can I run, make sure they hear this? The first devil's advocate is if you don't help the federal government, then the federal government is going to grow and they're going to get more agents because they need to do enforcement. The second one. Can I address that? And this is more of a moral thing from my own view. I don't think it's ever right to violate someone's rights even if choosing not to means someone else will. That's my view. Second one. Oh, shit, federal government shouldn't be taking money in the first place. Well, a lot of us have the taxation is theft thing on there. So uh, I'm into a... Yes. Why would they give money back? So like a JAG grant. So like the question is, if you're not going to cooperate, why would they do this? Well, that's a couple of things that comes down to what's called coercion. So for example, if the state made an agreement that they were going to enforce in order to get a specific grant, and then they just stop doing it, then they're going to lose that money. But in a majority of situations, like the Trump administration is specifically trying to take away DHS JAG grants from, uh, from immigration sanctuary cities where there was no stipulation that they were going to do this for the federal government. And so that's why he's getting kind of smoked in the, the federal courts. They, the executive branch can't just create new conditions like, okay, now we need emergency funding to do such and such. If Congress didn't create that condition in the first place or didn't change it later on, then they can't just take the funds away. So that's what they're running into right now because those conditions in most situations are not there. So, But what you're saying is logically correct. If they agreed like, oh, we're going to do this, then you've got a different problem to deal with. Does anyone else have a question? I think I only have another minute or two. Ryan? <laughs> I love you too, man. Oh, dude. <laughs> All right, I love this man. Okay, a lot of people have asked me about this over the years, and eventually the IRS is a really, really nasty organization that I wish they would just go get jobs rather than harming people, but there is a solution to that. I do not think anyone is ready for it yet. That's the only thing I guess I can say. Did you have a question here? Oh, many. Dude, I got like three minutes. There's no way I can, <laughs> there's no way. Yes. Yeah, it's a bad definition. So he's saying that it's like they've won political. But they use it on the opposite side. So a lot of people tell me like, oh, what do you mean? They're hiding. They're hiding them. They're like putting them in a church. And there's illegals everywhere. And they're protecting them from the federal government. They're, they're just, not, it, that's not happening. Oh, yeah. Nice, nice. So... No, their sanctuary is a bad term, and when San Francisco passed their ordinance in 1989, they called it the sanctuary ordinance. So they used it in the pro-sanctuary, immigration sanctuary city, and now uh, the anti-sanctuary city love calling it sanctuary. So it's just, it's a politicized term. It's marketing, but it's bullshit. Anybody else have a question? 
Cool. I love you guys. Thank you so much for having me. I unfortunately have to road trip down to L.A. in about an hour, but if you want to hang out and talk, I will be here.